It's my great pleasure to uh, be the chair of this last session today and uh, be introduced to uh, our sponsors who uh, give us some uh, recent achievements in uh, electrochemical uh, measurement setups and so on. So the first uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Zbigniew Karpuszewski uh, from Institut Photonowy and he will tell us a little bit about impedance camera for time resolved impedance spectroscopy. So the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for this kind of introduction. Um, I was told that uh, this conference will host a broad range of people with uh, scientific competence. So instead of focusing on a single technical topic, I would tell you a story. Uh, the story starts with a funeral. Uh, ten years ago, uh, uh, one of my friends died of brain cancer and uh, during ceremony of the funeral I mentioned to his family that uh, it was a pity that I kept this sickness kind of secret because I might have had help if I knew uh, beforehand about his condition and uh, lo and behold Three months later, his sister came to us with the same disease and in very similar age to, uh, uh, to my friend's uh, age when he died. So <coughs> I have founded at that time some of the research on the mild uh, chemotherapy for uh, brain tumors. And this was involving uh, chloride uh, uh, acid. Uh, Dichloroacetate. Uh, it was a small molecule that uh, you can just make a water solution, drink it, and the small molecule will bridge <coughs> blood brain barrier and it can be active in your brain. And it, its role was very simple it uh, tried to remove hyperpolarization of, uh, uh, of mitochondrial membranes, which are uh, pathologically large, those this polarization is large in tumor cells. Uh, but uh, when uh, my friend's sister came, uh, we offered her uh, or proposed to her two types of treatments. One was this mild uh, chemotherapy, and the other was uh, tumor treating fields, which is uh, quite different. Uh, type of uh, intervention. Those, uh, in, in 2004, uh, this uh, publication appeared uh, in Cancer Sir. Uh, it was by a group of Joram Palti, this is a professor from Technia. Uh, he noticed that uh, you can actually kill cells that would like to divide in your body. Most of the time, you don't want to do this because uh, you need uh, cells in your body to divide. But brain is special because the only division that happens there, I mean, neural cells do not uh, divide at all. But the support cells, real cells, when they divide, they often form tumors, and this condition is called, this disease is called uh, glioblastoma. And uh, uh, there is not that much that you can do because uh, of the sensitivity of the organ of the brain to any uh, external intervention. But tumor fitting fields are not invasive in the sense that uh, you just apply some uh, electromagnetic field. This is of frequency around 200 kilohertz to your scalp. And the aim is, or the goal of this field is, to disrupt uh, mitosis process. So, so this cell division process needs to be disrupted. Because if you do this, you may uh, kill the dividing cell. This is uh, a picture of, the, of a dividing cell. You can see, uh, do we have any pointers? Or Excuse me, do we have any pointers or something physical or there's one can we, over here, over here. 
Here. Oh, here it is. Here it is, and oh, yeah. uh, so you have uh, here the cellular membrane around, and you see this crescent forming because the cell is about to divide. It turns out that in order to this division to happen, you need to fulfill very strict electrostatic conditions. So there's a, an electrostatic field inside forming. Those lines here, they are small molecules, microtubules, they are tubules, I don't know how, if I pronounce it correctly in English. Uh, anyway, uh, they take apart chromosomes. Uh, each pair is being pulled towards the new sister cell. And because of this electrostatic field inside, it's very inhomogeneous. There, there are large gradients of the electric field. That means that the pressure will form in the cell. And the cell has to complete this uh, division quickly, within minutes. Otherwise, the pressure that builds up over here, or, or here, will break the membrane and the cell is dead. Right? So, everything that was in the cell uh, is spilled over, and you can see the traces of various biomarkers in the bodily fluids. And, yep. So, with this therapy, <coughs> this, this, this sister I told you about, she uh, had her tumor removed, but after that, uh, in uh, MRI, in magnetic resonance, it was uh, clear that the cancer cells are back. And she was past any other intervention because they were spread in such uh, regions that it was life threatening anyway if somebody would try to remove them. So the only thing was left uh, for her is to pray and perhaps come to us. Uh, if we had some idea. Uh, we didn't, we didn't uh, I would say we are not prepared to treat patients. We are just a technological company that has some ability to manufacture scientific instruments. That's it. However, uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Justina started wearing uh, our device based on the publication I showed you uh, a slide before. And she started it on uh, September uh, 2012. After one month, she had her first MRI to check if, if the therapy is working. Uh, it, it didn't seem to be working. Uh, it didn't seem to be working at the time because she still had new tissue being infected by, uh, by cancer cells. However, uh, in February next year, the scans came clean of cancer cells. So it, it really worked. And in, <laughs> in June the same year, she uh, resumed her uh, work as, as a normal person. She was just cut from eight hours a day to seven hours a day, but she was okay, all right? And then the news spread, uh, because these days people are using uh, social media and they have support groups when they are sick and they talk about their experiences. So she told that we might have helped her uh, with her uh, problem. And other people start coming to us to do the same. Uh, I must mention that this therapy, tumor picking field, it is uh, medical. Uh, it is available in the States, in Israel, in Germany. Uh, however, it is pretty expensive. The company formed by uh, Professor Joram Palati is called Novocure, and this device is called Optium. Uh, so it is available. However, the pricing is steep, uh, uh, even for. Uh, uh, for the states, uh, so government has to kick in with, uh, with some support. Anyway, uh, new people were coming, and when next 
person come, what do you do? Because we have used, just accidentally, the frequency of the fuse, which was 167.8 kilohertz. Shall we change it to another frequency or not? It is an awkward position to, to make a decision because if I decide to change it and, and the person dies, it's my fault, of course. If I don't change it and the person dies, it is also my fault. Uh, but we knew, and you can see it from the publication, that the, the efficiency of the therapy is kind of resonant. All right. So there, there is a frequency range where it is for a given person, where it works, and everywhere else it does not. So you have to decide uh, whether you are uh, in that uh, range or not, and you are really blind, you can guess only. So what happened? Uh, we left this uh, frequency unchanged. Uh, as if it, was, if it worked for one person, we hope, okay, we don't know anything to, to make a change, so we don't. We don't do any, we don't do, uh, any rushed moves. And uh, the story started from funeral, but then it is even sad. It is even worse. Because the therapy was not effective. I mean, we had some successes, but most of the time we were really helpful. Especially for men, for a woman, somehow uh, often we have some we had some improvements, but uh, for for male patients, it was hundred uh, percent disaster. It, it didn't help them at all. And uh, the reason might be that the cell size, I mean those cancer cell size for for male patients, they tend to be bigger. That means that the frequency that we are supposed to use, that we should use is smaller than, uh, than the one we used. But we still have no way of, of knowing that. And uh, in order to, uh, uh, to really close the feedback loop for the therapy, because we can change a couple of parameters in the fields, so we can adjust to how deep we'll penetrate what frequency we will use, what uh, amplitude of the field we can use. Because you cannot make the field too strong because you will heat up uh, the brain tissue, which is no good. You cannot uh, switch between frequ frequencies because you have to, if the cell is dividing uh, and you are not targeting the cell, the cell will divide and the tumors will grow. So we have only one frequency available at the time, and we would like to know how, uh, how we should direct it in order for the therapy to be more effective. And uh, the best way to go is to, uh, to use some biosensors, uh, because I told you that those uh, cells, when they die, they spill over their uh, genetic material, their proteins, everything uh, uh, to bodily fluids. And after some time, you can detect uh, the traces of it in blood, in urine, in saliva. And hopefully, uh, we can detect, we can find some markers that will tell us whether the cancer cells really decay, whether they really die. If not, then we can change frequency. And we can change the frequency in such a way so the signal is stronger and stronger of, of the dying cells. And the therapy will be more um, efficient. And here is a picture from a recent uh, study. It is a kind of a review of biosensors. And uh, they are classified here uh, into uh, I mean, oh, this I, I can use so the thing that you can detect in bodily fluids are either some genetic uh, molecules proteins those are of less interest for us uh, today but then you prepare your sensor with again 
another complementary genetic material or antibodies or enzymes or not antibodies but proteins that do the same job and they will uh, they will be uh, active for uh, anti-genes that are present uh, in the material that you want to detect. If you have this, then you have to somehow make a signal readout. And you can do it in many ways. Uh, very uh, sensitive are optical methods. You can really, I mean, there are reports of being able to detect uh, something below uh, femtomoles of substance. Uh, this is the direct detection uh, in, a, uh, in a serum, uh, in blood serum. There are mechani mechanical ways. I, they are less sensitive. Uh, and there is electrochemistry here, electrochemical sensors. And those are the most promising. Uh, why is that? All of those methods here, they require a lab and qualified technician to perform the tests. So they are slow, they are expensive, and they cannot be used uh, with uh, our uh, TTF uh, device. Because TTF device is just a small device, you, you keep it on you all the time, and you have electrodes attached to your scalp, and you just walk around uh, with it, but when you go to sleep, you take it down, and, or you can even sleep with it if you, uh, if you wish to. Uh, and then uh, the idea was that we can provide another device to this person right, that will change parameters according to the uh, biosigns that we are receiving uh, from the sensors. Like that. So electrochemical are the most promising because they are cheap. They are easy to, uh, relatively easy to, to read. And uh, they can be delivered. I mean, they don't need uh, any uh, competent staff to operate uh, the device that will do electrochemical analysis of, uh, at least they can be made, made this way. With plasmons or other optical stuff, you will not be able to, to perform. Uh, I mean, the ordinary person will not be able to operate. Okay, and we wanted it to be cheap because we would like to have this test being done at least once a day. And the choice for electrochemical uh, is most promising. And among electrochemical methods, you can measure currents, electric currents, you can measure uh, conductance, uh, you can measure impedance, uh, you can measure uh, voltages in different ways. Uh, I will be talking about this method because it kind of includes all the others. It is the broadest of them all. Um, so, this is how uh, a sensor, a biosensor, looks like. You may have seen uh, this picture on, on the pull-ups uh, outside from NLAP. They, they are distributing them uh, in, uh, in Poland. And uh, so those sensors already exist. However, they are good only for one thing. I mean, they are prepared for one thing, and there is no sensor so far for uh, biomarkers related to glioblastoma, to, to brain tumors, to the decaying cells of brain tumors, to be exact. So what you have uh, here, actually, th th there's a picture with the uh, Streptococcus uh, pyogenes. This is uh, a bacteria, but the idea is always the same. So you have antibody here that uh, receives the pathogen from, uh, from the solution. And then something electrically ch changes in this setup, so you can read out it with a impedance spectroscopy. And when you look into, into this review, 
you will see that people there can detect substances that are in the range of pico or even femtograms per milliliter. This is uh, significant. Why is that? Because if you try, uh, for example, use detect some uh, genetic material, what you do these days? What you have to do? You have to do most likely PCR because signal is so weak that you have to amplify it somehow. So you need to multiply those polymers, uh, I mean, RNA or DNA, you have to move, multiply the signal in order to see it. And with PCRs, it times, again, a lab, time and money. This is not to, it's not for home use. However, when you are able to, to directly detect uh, genical, uh, genetic molecules like uh, microRNA, those are markers of many microRNAs, or free cell DNA, if you can detect it directly without this amplification step, then you reduce all the costs and perhaps even you are more reliable at the end. Uh, since PCR introduces its own uh, uncertainties as to the result. And uh, this is what we would like to have, uh, to, to have this uh, feedback loop for, for TTF being closed. But it is not about TTF only. If you uh, look at medical uh, treatments uh, that are available in the West, East, wherever, there are very few therapies where you have uh, this feedback loop, this engineering concept that uh, you apply some therapy and you immediately check whether it works or not. If it doesn't, you change something. But usually what you do, you are given antibiotics uh, from, from a doctor and you come after a week or two weeks and see if you are alive, right? If this is the only feedback. If, if it helps, you are, you are good. If it doesn't help, they, they will change uh, the treatment then. But still, it requires their time and their knowledge and their skills. Uh, not the perfect solution for times uh, like we have these days. So, we would like our sensors to, to be cheap, meaning there is no need for a battery. I mean, there are labs on chips, but those are different things. They, they are cheap as well. Uh, but I, I'm talking about the building with the instrumentation in it. Uh, they are easy to use, so there is no, no need for qualified personnel to operate them. They are fast. They can be accurate. And they will have low limit of detection. But really to have this feedback going, it is... Uh, low limit of detection is not enough because if you can tell whether a given substance is in the sample or it isn't there, it's not enough. It's not good enough. You need to have uh, some quantification. So you need to have numbers. Uh, how much of a given, let's say, uh, micro RNA is there in the sample? All right. This is why you use this method called uh, impedance spectroscopy. Uh, I know that uh, there are not, not there are some non-specialists in the field uh, on the audience, so I will uh, quickly explain how it works because it is quite simple. First of all, uh, you need to understand what uh, what resistance is. This is an electrical term, but it is easy to, to to spot. You apply some potential to your sensor, and then you. After some time of, this is called transient, you have constant current as, uh, current as an output. So this is potential, this is uh, schematic. You apply potential, you have set your sensors here and you measure the current. And if the sensor has large resistance, this red level here will be squeezed down to zero. The larger the resistance, it will be closer to zero. If the resistance is small, it will go up. So this is the resistance. But uh, I was talking about impedance spectroscopy, not resistance spectroscopy. 
The idea is very similar. Again, you apply potential, but now this potential varies in time. It, is, it has a given frequency, it oscillates. So it is uh, alternating current, alternating potential. And as a result, you have alternating current. Again, what can happen here? If impedance is large of the sensor, I mean not impedance, resistance say, then this red signal will be squeezed more. So it will be very tiny. If, it is, if the impedance is small, the signal will be large. However, there is one more thing here that can happen. If you have this signal, you may see that uh, this one is a little bit delayed with respect to the original. And you need another quantity to describe this time delay. You, don't, you cannot have it in resistance because it is just one number, one, one uh, simple number. You need two numbers. You need the squeezing number and you need the time delay number. Okay? Uh, and those two numbers, squeezing and delay, are different for different frequencies of the signal applied. And this is why the impedance spectroscopy is so good, because it will give you many numbers for different frequencies. So it, it, it will have a large space uh, of your uh, output that you can put state of a sensor in. So you can have better sensitivity or better distinguishability of different states of, of a sensor. And uh, impedance spectrum looks, it has just these two numbers. Squeezing, which is squeezing was very little over here, and it grows larger over here. And this is, it, it, this time delay is called phase. And the time delay was here small for uh, low frequencies and it's higher for larger frequencies. If you have, but impedance is not uh, what we are after. We are, we are using impedance uh, spectroscopy, of course, but we would like to just look at the, <coughs> at the currents for now for different frequencies. And you see, where impedance was small, this current was large. This is amplitude of the current. So the, how far it is from the grooves to the, uh, I mean, peak by peak, from peaks to the, to, to, to the grooves of the, of, of the changing in time current. So small impedance, and here large impedance, so the signal goes down. Same thing with, uh, with the phase. Uh, because current is also described by two numbers in uh, time varying signals, not just by one, for the same reason as impedance. And, okay, so how do we use this uh, impedance spectroscopy? We use it in the following way. We apply our instrument which does the spectrograms, impedance spectrograms, to the sample, okay? And it gives you a continuous line. Then after some time, when something got attached to the sensor, it changes a little bit, and you see it in dotted line, okay? All well, these changes. And you need to somehow determine those changes, because those changes are hopefully proportional to the amount of substance you have detected in the uh, in the electrolyte, in the analyte that you that you are after. Okay. There is one problem though uh, with this approach. The problem is the following: that if you are electrochemistry practitioner, one of the first things you learn is that your sample is changing in time, and to fight it. It's hopeless, you need to rather understand how it changes. Uh, so it means that if you do uh, impedance spectroscopy, usually you do it like this. 
I go with the first frequency, I measure impedance. I go with the second frequency, I measure impedance. And by the time I'm at last frequency, the sample has changed. So here impedance is for different sample than it was at the beginning. And if I even get the impedance spectrum, the impedance spectrogram, I cannot really analyze it in a meaningful way because it corresponds to different samples being somehow encoded into a single line. It's hopeless most of the time. So, but there is a remedy to that. The remedy is the following. Uh, wrong way. Instead of applying each frequency one after another at the time, you combine them all into single signal, and the signal will look like this. It looks more, more like noise than a signal, but it is, it is not any noise. You apply it to our sensor, to the sample. You measure current, and you receive noise, okay? <clears throat> and you can do it very fast. I mean, all frequencies are being applied at the same time, so data is consistent now. And the period of your measurement can be short. And then you can repeat this measurement. And you repeat it again. And this is what's called time resolved uh, impedance spectroscopy. So you measure one impedance spectrum after another. And you have kind of movie of spectra. Because at single shot, you take a photo of the state of the sample with a given uh, impedance spectrum, and then you move to the next, to the next, and hopefully you will be able to see the change in time when your, your desired uh, molecules attached to the, to the sensor, or you can really see it uh, in real time, how it happens. However, uh, with uh, traditional impedance spectroscopy, you make uh, one assumption that in case of electrochemistry and uh, biosensing is nasty. You assume that all those samples, that when you do <laughs> this measurement here, uh, and you get result, uh, impedance spectrum, and you compare it with the spectrum, when you measure every frequency at the time, single frequency, they will differ, even if the sample is stable. Even if it doesn't change in time, they will differ. Okay? And why they are different? I mean, that why they will be different? Because they are nonlinear. This is a, a, a dangerous word, but I can, uh, but this is a very simple concept. When you have some voltage and you apply it to sensor, you got some, some current, okay? If you have different voltage, you apply it to sensor, you get different current. When you apply some of those voltages and you obtain the sum of the currents, then you say, my sample is linear. Okay, so very simple concept. Uh, LTI means linear time invariant. And also, there's also assumed in a software for impedance spectroscopy that our sample does not change in time. And I don't mean uh, input signal can change in time, output signal can change in time, but the sample itself works always the same. No matter when I excited with another signal, I will get the same response. And this is not true. It is uh, obviously not true in electrochemistry. Uh, so, uh, but this is not, uh, not the only problem. Another problem is, of course, people know that the samples are nonlinear in electrochemistry, and also the same knowledge is <laughs> common among manufacturers. 
So what they will, uh, to address this issue, they would say, okay, let's find a linear space when our analysis can be applied in a meaningful way. Meaning, don't you ever increase your amplitude of those sine waves too much because you will enter nonlinear regime and anal automatic analysis will be uh, questionable at best. If you do that and you still want to detect small traces of biomarkers in an analyte, then you are lowering the sensitivity of all other methods. So you may not be able to really find what you are looking for in, uh, in the bodily fluids. Because it's better to have uh, the signal large enough so you can detect small amounts of, I don't know, those, uh, for example, uh, microRNAs. And if you, uh, you may remember from previous slides that we had electric current and it changed because of uh, something happened to it or it has received a molecule that it was designed for. So there is this change, but it is a typical way of uh, depicting uh, signals in impedance spectroscopy. This scale here is in decibels. I mean, this, this current is in decibels, so it is effectively logarithmic scale. If you make your voltage, the stimulus small, uh, then you will end up not seeing any change at all, though this, the change was, if it, uh, because in real life, you, you have signal like this. This is only that large because you use logarithmic scale and zero is in the infinity down there. But here zero is on this level when you drop the logarithmic uh, axis here, just linear. So what you can see, when you decrease the level of the signal, this will go down and you will end up over here when there is no distinction basically between uh, molecule being found and not fun. So you lose your limit of uh, detection and sensitivity of, of the sensor. So you better uh, you better not uh, rely on linearity of the samples because you will hurt if, if your project is to be more sensitive to, to, to molecules in analyze, you are doing yourself this service. Another problem is it's, it's more technical. There are some systematic errors in analysis of uh, signals from, from sensors, but I, I won't go into that. So what we can do uh, in order to uh, actually have a sensor to be a cheap sensor that will be accurate enough, sensitive enough, so we, it can guide a therapy uh, to be more eff efficient or to be useful, actually. First of all, uh, it's good to embrace nonlinear phenomena. Uh, people uh, may think that they are difficult, but trying to understand a sample in electrochemistry with a linear model is even harder. Why is that? It is impossible because all the samples are nonlinear. And uh, only if you understand the samples, you will be able to design a sensor that is useful, that has enough uh, power to detect what's needed. Then, again, uh, understanding samples, meaning to be able to predict how they behave, before you do experiments on them. If you are on this stage uh, of competence, 
then you may say, okay, I understand it, and I may make it useful for other things than just science. And uh, we should avoid systematic errors, like the one that uh, would assume sample to be linear, even if it, it's not. And here is the device uh, that we have been careful to design uh, to avoid some of the pitfalls of uh, impedance spectrometry. So this is, uh, this is not large. This is impedance camera. This is a small device. And uh, what it does, it has uh, some different approach to signal analysis than it is uh, that you can find in uh, other uh, softwares uh, available uh, on the market. It gives you, even if a sample is varying in time, it is fast enough to uh, show you picture after picture after picture how this change happens. And uh, when you purchase such a device, you can also purchase from us uh, some, oh, not, not purchase, you, can, you, you will get training in how to uh, deal with uh, nonlinear phenomena in your samples. And they happen all the time people mostly try to ignore them or try to uh, wiggle their room in the linear space so that there is something to be, uh, to be shown that is, that is approximately linear, but it is not good enough when you try to have a commercial sensor that, will, uh, that somebody's health will depend. So the only way actually is to understand uh, how many artists work, and uh, I will also show before before we go to <coughs> to the demonstration of the device, I will also show some specs. Uh, it can work in two electrode and three electrode uh, setup. It can have it has has frequencies from very low ones to to one megahertz, and it can deliver you a, a ton of data. You can have forty megabytes per second if you use the highest uh, acquisition rates. This is a lot of data. Hopefully, this will help in s sensitive readout of, of the sensors. Uh, and may I ask you to, I will turn this off right now and we'll switch to another computer. And we'll just quickly demonstrate uh, to you the main idea how it works. I will need this monitor. So, uh, can, can you make it larger? All right, better. Uh, what we will see here, uh, you just set up uh, in the basic, most basic operation, you set up the minimum frequency that you are interested in, the maximum frequency, and number of frequencies that will be uh, used for your impedance spectrum, and then you click start. Can you can you show it? And those are, uh, are, are they impedance amplitude. Uh, you see, they are, they are changing in time. And why is that? It is because our sample that we are measuring here, it is light sensitive. And we have here light that changes in time as well. So the intensity of the light changes, and it's reflected uh, in the change of the amplitude of impedance. Uh, can, can you show currents, for example, how, how they behave? Uh, you, you see the same thing in, in currents, right? Uh, so wherever impedance, uh, you have frequency on that axis, you have currents, the amplitude on that axis, 
and you have time. So different impedance spectra or different spe current spectra here are different necklaces of, the, of those dots. And yes, uh, we, if I got interest you, that's, that would be enough. You can uh, learn more from our stand here. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this interesting presentation. So, do you have any questions? Comments? Yes, please. Uh, I have one viewing here. When you explain, uh, not in this plot, but before, uh, uh, the impedance, maybe you found that the sensor has uh, larger impedance for higher frequencies. So yeah, I would rather expect from yeah, every sensor to have some capacitance to uh, have some yeah, opposite behavior. But for usually for lower frequencies is higher impedance and not for higher. So it's some kind of uh, inductive sensor. It has some no. quite apparent inductance. No, 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 no. No, it is just a low pass filter. It's just low pass filter. Uh, it has just ah. just a resistor and just a capacitor. So there's no inductance here. Any other questions? Yes, please. Uh, but you, you are, of course, right. Uh, with impedance, uh, you can use uh, whatever linear elements you want. It can be capacitors, resistors, uh, inductances, plus Gerisher elements, constant phase elements, uh, Wadbrook elements, whatever you use. They are all linear and they are time invariant. So, uh, uh, my argument is still valid. Whether you use capacitors or other things, you are still in the uh, realm of, uh, of signals. Or may, may I ask one more short? Of course. Uh, and also, yeah, when you measure the, all the frequencies at the same time, in, in electrochemical systems, especially when the uh, resistance of solution is low and the process is slow, so there is huge differences in impedance for high and low frequencies, and sometimes require it. Uh, precise measurements uh, requires uh, different uh, ranges. Of Dynamical time. ranges for, for the measurement. You are right, and we cannot uh, cope with that. We just what we do. We have uh, just uh, sixty-five thousand levels, which you can move along the ranges, different ranges for current, because the current is here the most. Uh, important parameter, how low current you can measure. So you, you divide it into ranges and you have that many levels for a given range. If your sample happens to go uh, over multiple ranges, uh, at the moment we cannot help that. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Okay. We have another question. Why did you say that the fast Fourier transform is the problem of systematic uh, error? Yeah. Uh, there are, uh, I said that the method we are using is a uh, multi-frequency method or multi-sign method. It is known under other names uh, in the literature. However, uh, and the Fourier transform is all right. Uh, it was developed in 1795 by an engineer in, in, in France. Uh, but people, still do not grasp the essence of the Fourier transform and fast Fourier transform included. It is when you have a signal that you prepared yourself, you know the frequencies that are in that signal. However, uh, if you use on that signal Fourier transform, you will not be getting uh, the frequencies that you achieve, that, that you input into the signal. You will get amplitudes over frequencies or ladder of frequencies that are artificially made, I would say, for the analysis. So there were, Fourier had a friend, it, called, it was called, I mean, it was Baron de Crony, and he developed competitive methods to the Fourier transform. And with this method, you not only find the amplitudes for given arbitrary uh, frequencies, 
but you also, in the first step, you find the frequencies that are in the signal. That, are, that really are there, not the one that, you know, you just make a sieve of frequencies, uh, usually equidistant, on any signal you want. And the signal can have whatever frequencies, but they are usually not that uh, well behaved. Meaning that when using FFT, you introduce a systematic error. Because you assume, you may not know it, but you really do assume frequencies that are not in the signal. And if your method is to be sensitive, as sensitive as it, as as it possibly can, doing systematic errors does not help the goal. <laughs> I, can, I can tell you even more. You have, in quantum mechanics, you have this stupid notion of time energy uh, uncertainty relation. You have other one, momentum and position of Heisenberg uh, uncertainty relation, and it is good. But time energy is not. It is, it is assigned to Bohr during one of his uh, quarrels with Einstein during Solvay meetings that he devised this. Uh, dimension, dimensional analysis when he came up with the time energy uncertainty relation, meaning that if you have your signal very short in time, that you cannot determine the energy that are inside. This is completely false. And there are methods of, even from very short signals, you can uh, distill the actual frequencies to any accuracy you want, provided that the signal has no Noise. Okay, so I think that the discussion can be continued during the poster session. So let's thank the speaker again. Uh,